Hello and welcome everyone to our Supernova workshop. My name is Andrew. I work in the Affinity's growth team. Before we start, let me just say that uh, this session is being recorded and we will upload it later uh, on the Affinity's YouTube channel. Today, we have uh, Tommy from IC Gallery. He's the, the co-founder and lead dev. Welcome, Tommy. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Hello, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I want to talk about IC Gallery and, of course, uh, gaming on the internet computer. But before we jump into that, could you please briefly describe what you did before the IC and also how you discovered the internet computer? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so my journey begins at Disney. Uh, I started working there uh, on a Marvel game uh, called Marvel Strike Force. Uh, it's uh, an RPG uh, that managed to actually get to number one on like the RPG iOS uh, app store uh, and generated, I think, like $200 million a year during the, the uh, pandemic. Um, when everyone was playing video games, you know, on their couch. Uh, and then after that, I shifted to working on uh, Avatar game for James Cameron's Avatar movie that's coming out this Christmas, finally. Uh, it's been <laughs> many, many years, and he's delayed it many, many times. So uh, it's exciting that it's actually finally going to come out. I'm definitely going to see it in theaters. Um, and yeah, that was a 4X strategy game uh, that's currently unreleased. I believe it's still in soft launch. Um, but yeah, it's not, not available yet. Awesome. So yeah, how did you find the internet computer? Yeah, so uh, it's actually a funny story, I guess. The, I was just like browsing through Twitter, I think like a, a week before the Genesis launch of internet computer. And I saw the name and immediately I was like, that's such a weird name for a blockchain. Like I have <laughs> to know what, what this is. Uh, and so I, I remember I, I, what I tend to do is I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I went on Spotify. Uh, found the first podcast I could from Don McWilliams, uh, saved it, and then I was on a plane flight, and so I was like, I'll listen to this, might as well now, um, and I devoured it. It was like, I, I love like very technical podcasts that like dive into to, like the details of how, you know, a blockchain works, um, and so when, when I, like I was, at the time, like I was listening to podcasts from like Avalanche, Cosmos, um, Solana, and so I was kind of in flow and I was like comparing all the different tech and like internet computer just blew them out of the water with like how unique it was. Like none of the other ones could even host like web applications or had like their front ends or back ends like on, on chain. Um, so immediately, like as soon as like Dominic was describing it, I was like, this is AWS on a blockchain um, and it has the potential to basically like replace all these centralized cloud services that currently exist uh, today, like AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. Um, and then I, I did a little bit more research and I was like, okay, like all these, uh, all these front ends for Ethereum dApps are currently being run on AWS and Google Cloud anyways. Like you got like, I mean, they're, they're starting to shift now to like uh, a lot of more hosting on Filecoin. But at that time, like Uniswap and like, uh, all, like a lot of these, like OpenSea, like all these other platforms are being run from, you know, AWS or Google. So it's like, what, what's the point, you know, of, of doing that? Um, exactly. Yeah. Like, why have it, AWS and and uh, connecting to the blockchain when you can do everything all at once? It's, exactly. Uh, it's yeah. And, yeah, and it, it's weird that like the I, and there's there's a lot you know there's still a lot to do to make the internet computer scalable, um, but yeah, I mean, the, I think eventually it'll become the de facto way to host a front end. That's the goal. Eventually, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, um, so you, you mentioned in the in the Supernova kickoff event video that uh, you studied the IC gallery about eight months ago, and eight months is an eternity in crypto time. So can you walk <laughs> us through about what uh, how the progression with uh, with IC gallery was and what kind of thing did you work on? Yeah, in the past yeah. Eight yeah. So yeah, I guess like uh, IC gallery started kind of just like as this idea between ICP maximalists and I. Um, and we kind of just wanted to create this virtual space where like we noticed there's all these NFT collections launching and we wanted to create this cool 3D space where they could walk around and, you know, enjoy the NFT artwork from all these different collections. And so that was kind of the initial vision of the IC gallery, which is, you know, uh, giving the community a way to interact, you know, more than just, you know, scrolling through a web page. Uh, and so we, so we built out the original Genesis gallery, uh, 
And yeah, it was really cool. Like at that time, I think that was in like August or September. Um, it was like the very beginning of the IC ecosystem of NFTs. So like, you know, you had the chronics and the IC punks uh, like sold out within seconds. Right. Like you had, it was, it was very cool to, you know, be in that. Uh, and it's, it's funny that it was only eight months ago. It feels like two years ago. And so ago. six months, yeah, six, seven months. Yeah, of yeah six months. Yeah, it's crazy. It um, feels like forever ago. I remember these <laughs> times. It's, uh, yeah, it was a crazy ride. A lot of, a lot of things happened every week. Yeah, yeah. It, it changes every day. And then that's the other thing is, so once, once we built the gallery, we kind of realized like this, this is a really cool product, but there's a problem. And, and I guess the problem is that there was a lot of saturation in that space. Like there's so many companies trying to build galleries and not, they're all kind of copying each other. None of them really innovating in any way. Um, and there's also, we, we saw this issue where people had no incentive to, you know, go to a gallery or check out a gallery if it didn't belong to them or if their NFTs weren't shown in it. Um, right. And so it's more of a one-time demo than a, than a, something that can come back to every every now and exact, then. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and I think there, there's definitely like uh, potential in this space. And you know, we've seen projects like uh, on Cyber kind of rise up and and create these really beautiful uh, galleries. Um, but it just we, we kind of realized pretty quickly that it wasn't really what we wanted to do. Uh, and so that's why we and it, it also didn't really match our expertise either. So I come from like a, a game dev background and, you know, my, my expertise is in building fun games that bring people back, you know, every day. Uh, and so that's kind of what we wanted to pivot to was, you know, building a, a Web3 native game. Um, and, you know, in doing that, we also wanted to make sure we weren't uh, falling, falling like a trap to all the, you know, issues of building a play to earn game. Um, I, think, I think there's all these crypto native developers that create, uh, you know, crypto games, um, and they don't really know how to make a game fun without crypto, you know? Yes, and that's the problem. Like blockchain first and gameplay second. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And that's, if, if it's not fun to come back to the game every day to play for the, for the gameplay elements, then it's going to be a lot more, all right, let me try to make money every day on, on the game. And it's not as, not as exciting as, as just being, the game being fun, and then you have a layer of crypto on top of it. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it's, it's short term thinking, I think, you know, giving like short term incentives for players to join your game. Um, it can, you know, it can prop up your numbers in the short term and drive engagement. But then, you know, if the crypto market crashes or, uh, you know, as we've seen with like UST and other things like that, you know, it can cause essentially, a, you know, a, a Ponzi crash um, because you're not really you're not creating value. You're just attracting value with temporary incentives. Um, so anyways, we, we decided we were going to build this uh, meritocratic uh, game world. And uh, yeah, we're really excited. We're, we're hoping that we can reveal it to you soon. Um, and it's going to start out really simple. Um, I, I guess our, our main vision is that we want to keep it uh, you know, iterable. So we'll, we'll be you know, testing small versions of the game and getting feedback from the users and seeing if they actually enjoy playing it or not. Uh, cause we don't, we don't want to assume, you know, what, what you guys enjoy and what you guys don't enjoy. So anything you can tell us, or it's still, uh, it's still a bit of a secret. Uh, it's still a bit of a secret. I'll, I'll just say it's more in the hyper casual game genre. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's more catering okay. for, towards people who aren't necessarily hardcore gamers. Um, so, because we, we realize like a lot of the people who are into NFTs aren't necessarily hardcore gamers. Um, right. like a lot, a lot of like hardcore gamers currently that, you know, play games like League of Legends or Call of Duty or whatever it may be, actually have this weird bias against NFTs because they think it's a scam. Um, so it's actually a lot of people who are like crypto natives who really understand NFTs. Um, yeah, if you, if you sell your World of Warcraft character or account to someone on a black market, that's fine. But if it was an NFT and you sold it to the marketplace, that's, uh, that's childish. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Got it. I, yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's just weird. Even with my friends, I, I remember, you know, when I first told them I was working on NFT projects, even at my previous place of work, um, we, my, my CTO announced that, you know, they were doing some research into NFTs and Web3. And immediately the Zoom chat was just like, why are we doing this? It's bad for the environment. NFTs are a scam. And these are from, you know, game developers. Um, so like a lot of people just don't understand them. Uh, and that's something that will take time. Uh, just like crypto took a long time for people to understand as well. Um, 
so yeah, lots of things working. Yeah. But but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be building a hyper casual game. Um, so hopefully, like anyone, including your mom and dad, could play it and enjoy it. Awesome. Yeah, I look forward to that that uh, world when we can have that. Um, and I guess the hundred thousand uh, dollar monkey JPEGs kind of ruined it or painted a bad picture of NFTs. But now it's it's kind of our or your task to to build it back up and create actual fun games and you know, create useful experiences with NFTs, not just the overpriced JPEGs. Also, yeah. on the IC, we don't have hundred thousand dollar NFTs anyways. Yeah, yeah, so, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it's, very it's, yeah, it's very it's very true. I think um, I've noticed like a lot of the just you know like million dollar JPEGs uh, or the 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 NFT projects that sold these million dollar JPEGs. A lot of them don't have uh, people with game development experience, you know, on their teams. And so we've noticed in the game industry that there's all these NFT projects going out to game companies and asking them to develop their games for them Um, because they they can't do it in-house. So they're just, you know, reaching out to the main publishers of games to do it for them. Um, And I think that's what Board Ape Yacht Club is doing as well. Uh, I think they partnered with like Animoca Brands, which is like the largest uh, video game company in the Web3 space. Um, so yeah, I wonder how how they can create a game world in which you interact with the blockchain uh, frequently. Since if you if each interaction with the blockchain costs you gas fees, then it's it's going to be hard to scale a game to to many players. But I mean that's a, a tactical challenge for them to uh, to figure yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing is that I think for them, everything will be off chain except for the NFT transaction itself. Um, which is a funny way to think of, like when they say like, this is an on-chain game on Web3, like really the only thing that's on-chain is that you're logging people in with MetaMask. And then when people want to transfer their NFTs, you're doing it through MetaMask for them. Like that's the only thing that's on-chain. Um, so is it really like this Web3 vision that you guys are, you know, selling to the world? Decentralized. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so that's why, I mean, the internet computer really is the only blockchain I've seen that that allows us to actually have a true, like fully decentralized tech stack. Uh, and, and it's a very big task to get there. Like I, w- I would say the internet computer isn't even fully there yet, like especially like with hosting games, but it's the only one, it's the only blockchain capable of doing that even uh, in the future. Like no other it, chains even come close. It takes time. It takes time and uh, a lot of development. Um, so, okay, you can show your new game, but is there anything uh, else you can show us? Any other demos uh, up your yeah. sleeve? Yeah, we can show you a demo of an old build. Um, awesome. Let, let me get my screen share up. And I promise I'm going to ask more technical questions as well. So we got sidetracked a bit on, on <laughs> NFTs, but uh, technical questions are coming. And also anyone in the audience, please feel free to fill a Q&A with questions to Tommy. Ask about uh, IC gaming. It can be technical. It can be just uh, ideas. So uh, feel free to ask questions. Sweet. And you're able to see my screen? Yes, looks good. Perfect. All right, so this is uh, a demo we have. Uh, This is a build from maybe a month ago. Uh, So most of the stuff that you'll see here is uh, gonna be completely different uh, when we we release final version. Um, But we'll take you to the original gallery here. What's cool about this is, each of these worlds is uh, running like on a different server. Uh, unfortunately, these servers are off-chain at the moment. Uh, we're working with the Definity team to uh, host these on-chain in the future. Um, but you'll see here we have uh, art from many different NFT projects. And this was built back in October, I believe. So most of these projects uh, you know, are, are older. Um, but we got Dominic over here. I think on... Um, on this side, we actually have some of the Moonwalker. Yeah, here we have a Moonwalker. Be a better view. Oh, nice. Um, so this is cool yeah, too because uh, this is actually also multiplayer. Uh, there's no one else on this multiplayer map though right now with me, so that's why I, I should have I should have sent you the link. Or can can you open it? I think you know the link, right? Uh, no, I don't. Can you drop it in the chat, or would that be too too dangerous? Mm-hmm. Everyone uh, jumping in. Yeah, let me send it to you on Slack. Uh, we have an audience member who wants to join as well. Um, well, we don't, the, the link is private, so I don't really want to. Okay, so you can send it to me on, on Slack. Yeah. Sweet. 
Got it. All right, I'll go back to the original world. And there he is. <laughs> ah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> as, we, as we enter, oh, that's really cool. But okay, so this is the, the multiplayer part of it runs off chain, right? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, so okay. so your, your client is running uh, from the internet computer, um, but it's connecting to, yeah, uh, basically a, a server that's simulating the physics and the, the environment and ensuring that you're not cheating. Uh, and that's basically the purpose of that server. Um, okay. I've, I've heard some, some advancements in, in people trying to get multiplayer uh, hosted on 100% on chain. But uh, are you guys working on that as well for, for the new game? Or, or yeah, if it's hyper casual, you don't need necessarily real time. Oh, no, we, 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 are, we are working on that. Yeah. Because um, it's really important for us to have anti-cheat so you know like uh our games are going to be competitive and people are going to be war like earning uh real nfts that are worth real money so there can't be any room for cheating you know when, when something like that's at stake um so we're actually working with uh andrew tang from Definity. he's in charge of the web3 games at Definity um to see if we can find a solution to run um real-time game servers on the internet computer directly there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, though. Like, we can dive into the technicals of how feasible that is. Um, yeah, please. So I guess with, with running, like, a real-time, you know, game server, uh, you need a ping of at least, like, under 50 seconds, let's say. Um, or, sorry, 50 milliseconds. Uh, yeah. And so with the current IC uh, update consensus, it takes one to two seconds. And even to send, you know, a message from one end of the world to the other end of the world, I think is like 200 milliseconds. So it's, you, you can't really get under uh, that physical barrier unless you have servers all around the world that are positioned near your location. So like, let's say I'm playing League of Legends, the way that League of Legends allows me to have a ping of, you know, 15 is that there's a server that it finds that's close to my location. And then that's the server it uses. Uh, and so, Basically, to, to get to that point, the IC uh, somehow needs to have, to have nodes that are, you know, located close to you, and it needs, you need to access those nodes when you're, you know, accessing your real-time game server. Um, and, and, and hopefully, that would also increase your update time. But I think to do uh, consensus between all the canisters on the IC, it, it, will, take at le it will, will take at least, you know, one second, um, or at least that 200 millisecond barrier of sending a message around the world. Um, yes, but what about the query calls? Because query calls take uh, 100 to 200 milliseconds. I think, they, I guess, also depending on how, how close the, the boundary nodes are to you. Yeah, yeah. And query calls, yeah. I mean, query calls could probably be a lot faster as well. Um, so that, that's that, but, but you, when you like, imagine you're doing like a boss fight and you have like, you know, 10 players and they're all fighting this big monster and they're doing, you know, attacks that damage its health or whatever. And then other players need to have that synced up that they know that the monster's health is lower. All those different things require real time, um, you know, with ping under 30 milliseconds. Um, and and it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, it, they're updates, so that they're updating uh, game data. One, one uh, workaround that, you know, I've thought of as, as a possibility is, you know, right now we're basically hosting a game server, uh, like a Unity headless server instance within a Linux environment. Uh, and so if we were somehow able to essentially run like a, a Linux OS in a canister and then, you know, host our, our, our Unity like headless build inside of that canister and, and basically do it the same way that we currently do it. Um, right. That might work because technically the server doesn't need to make any state changes like during the real time. Like when I'm running around like this, it, it's not making any, it's not changing the database, right? It's just like syncing up the movements uh, between the players. It's only when I make like a specific action, like I pick up an item, I cross a finish line, uh, you know, I, I change a setting. Those are the things that actually get written to the database. And those things can take, it's fine for those things to take, you know, one to two seconds. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. But so. You can have that, uh, yeah, you pick up the item and the front end shows that you picked up the item and it takes two seconds for, uh, for the server to get back to you and, and, and finalize it or you know, change the state. In the, exactly. In the backend. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that that's probably that that's the direction that we want to head, and so we're working with Andrew to see if that's possible as well. Um, 
but I think there's definitely a possibility there, you know, where essentially all you're doing is, is writing the main important actions to the canister backend. Um, so you're not, because it doesn't really make sense. You don't really need consensus or update calls for every movement that you make, you know, um, with a player. It, it really, I don't know, it's, it's, I think it's a bit of overkill. Yes. So wait, the, the, the assets that you upload here, are they hosted on chain? And it's only the multiplayer logic that is uh, the server that is off chain. Yeah. Yep. That's correct. So okay. yeah, all the all the assets, uh, the art, textures, materials. Uh, yeah. Everything yeah. on that's running on your client. Yeah. It's it's all on chain. So as well as oh sorry, go ahead. Yep. No, no. Go on. Go on. Go on. Oh, I was just gonna say as well as we also host some of our uh, database uh, data as well on chain. So we use uh, Pseudograph which is a database, a GraphQL database implementation by Jordan Last. Uh, and yeah, it's really cool. Uh, and it allows us to store some of our data on the IC as well. Um, we, are, we are using like MongoDB as a backup database because uh, the pseudograph by Jordan Last is still not production ready. Um, but we're really excited because he's uh, targeting like the middle to end of this year for it to be completely production ready. And then, you know, you can use that fully as your database on the IC. Uh, yeah, so that is exciting. Side. Same with that. So like he's, he also targets uh, Q3 or Q4 to or even even uh, before to launch as well as, as production ready this summer. That's uh, that would be it. That's the developing TypeScript with the TypeScript on developing, developing canisters with TypeScript on the IC. Yeah, and, and that's actually huge because um, we, we had this issue where we couldn't do cross canister queries. Um, it would basically cause it to be an update call rather than a query call. Uh, and so Azul actually solved that issue. So I'm super excited because basically like when, when he has Azul and Pseudograph fully implemented, um, I mean, that's going to change so much. And yeah, Jordan, Jordan has his hand in so many important tools on the IC. It's very important to the, to the IC community, that's for sure. Yes. So yeah, I wanted to ask you about the uploads because you seem to have a lot of assets uploaded to, to the IC and it's uh, two questions. So what is the usual file size? What is the size of the environment of the assets? And how do you deal with uploading to the IC? I assume you use some kind of multi-canister uh, design. Yeah, so we actually use, there's, there's something called the addressable system uh, in Unity. And basically what you can do is when you build your Unity build for WebGL, you can just have the code uh, bundled up into the executable and then have all your scenes that contain, you know, your, the, 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 the biggest files in game development are the textures. So like, uh, you know, that smiley face and, and the different colors and, and materials you see uh, on the environment. So th those can be bundled up separately. Uh, and then when you load into the game, so like for instance, Let's go to this world that I created called the Desert Moon. Uh, when I click this button, it'll download all of those textures and materials right now instead of when I started the game. So right now it's downloading all those materials and then boom, we're into the world. That was pretty fast. Yeah, it's pretty so, detailed compared to the speed I downloaded. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of that is optimization as well. Um, with game development, optimization is probably one of the biggest things you have to do all the time. Uh, and so, yeah, like optimizing how large the textures are, making sure they're power up two textures so they can be compressed uh, correctly. Um, and then, of course, like th there's things you can do with optimizing performance. You know, uh, if you want to like make a mobile game or make a WebGL game, you usually have to optimize that as well to make sure you're not, you know, overheating people's computers as well. Uh, can you describe more in detail how what kind of optimizations you did with, uh, for example, this this scene? Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess like the, the main optimizations that we made were uh, the whole scene uses one texture. Uh, so if you can imagine, it looks like one big image with a bunch of rainbow colors on it, and each of those colors maps to a different object in the scene. Um, and so, if you know, oh, look, right. So it's one file, one asset that is connected to the whole scene, and then once in game, the uh, the logic somehow figures out how to place the the texture. Yeah. So then, so then the the graphics engine, you know, takes each of the pixels from that image, and then you know maps them over a three D object. Um, but you'll notice, like the ground is all one color. Uh, these crystals are all one color with slight uh, gradient on them. Um, 
the, so like most of the scene is from one texture. Uh, the, the things that aren't part of that texture would are the, uh, the moonwalker. So that's also loaded with our addressable system. So that's loaded at runtime. And, th and that's what I recommend for Unity developers. If you're building a game, you know, that requires, uh, you, you want good graphics, you want, you know, detailed textures, load them at runtime. Don't bake them into your, to your executable build. Uh, I, I definitely recommend using the addressable system. Um, and so, yeah, so all these animals as well, um, each, when, it, when an animal spawns, it'll download that asset at runtime and then spawn that animal. So it's not, none of that's done ahead of time. And the reason for that is that you don't want to wait, that we don't want to have users wait a long time before the scene uh, loads in. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's one of the most important things when, when you're building a game is that it, like every second that a user has to wait, I think a, a user's attention spans like, is like two seconds. So if they have to wait longer than like two or three seconds, they get bored and they'll click off of your game. Um, and it's something with, with mobile games, it's the same thing. Like we, we uh, put months and months into making our build as small as possible because the, mo the hardest thing to do is to get a user to download your game from the app store. And if it's a hundred megabytes larger, they might not wait long enough to download it. Um, so yeah, 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 that, that makes sense. Um, so, uh, we have a, we have a question in chat. Uh, have you ever thought of a hybrid approach for the game state sync, like a speculative run on the client side with the very same logic also on chain, um, maybe even some Rust code eventually on chain confirmation with lag, but for earnest players it would look and feel as real time interaction. Yeah, yeah. So I think they're they're basically hinting at like client side prediction, um, and that's yeah, that's definitely something that that we're looking into. Um, that's, that's actually kind of what we've implemented now with uh, the Mongo database, uh, because with, with Mongo DB, you have, uh, you know, like 100 millisecond uh, write updates. So what we're doing is we're doing like a 100 millisecond write update to the Mongo database in parallel as we're doing a two second write update to the IC. Um, and the Mongo database, you know, returns that it's finished before the IC does. And so the client just assumes, okay, everything works. Um, but if the IC later returns, you know, this doesn't work, like some, there was an error, then the client will, you know, will crash and it'll let you know that there was an error. Um, but, but for all intents and purposes, the client will assume that everything went well. I guess but more, more often, ah, okay, so it's, uh, you're cheating a bit with MongoDB and then if everything works, then the, the player doesn't notice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I think, you know, at some point we'll, we'll probably shift off of using MongoDB and just make the player wait two seconds. I think two seconds is actually not that long for a player to wait. It's more for if you have like really quick real-time uh, gameplay, then it's, it might be more pertinent to have uh, client-side prediction. Uh, our player movement though, so, so this is actually something, a good thing to bring up. The, the player movement at the moment is uh, server authoritative movement. So what that means is uh, every time I press, you know, a key on my keyboard, it sends the, the, it tells the server what key I pressed, and then the server simulates the movement that I make. And then once the movement's done on the server, it sends back to the client what the client should move. Um, so the client doesn't control the movement at all. Uh, it's completely controlled by the server. And what that means is that the client can't cheat. Um, so the client can't say like, you know, I'm, I'm 100, 100 times faster than I actually am. Um, because the server will just uh, be like, no, you're not. And it will set you right back to where you were. Uh, so that's, that's a, an important thing to have, you know, in a game that relies on, on movement and you don't want cheating. Um, and that uses something also called client-side prediction to simulate, because the, the client doesn't have enough time to wait, you know, for the server to get back and tell it where it is. So the client predicts, you know, where it'll be in the next second. And then when the server, you know, comes back and tells it where it actually is, it syncs it up. Uh, hopefully that that explanation made sense, but yeah, it does. It does, and it's uh, it is really cool because it looks super smooth. So you don't you don't necessarily see, you don't see yeah, yeah. The, any lag or any like teleporting accidentally. Across. Exactly, and that, and that's due to the client side prediction. Yep, exactly. If there weren't any client side prediction, you would definitely see some some like teleportation happening. Yeah, awesome. So. Getting back to file sizes and textures, have you thought of creating maybe a native, uh, a native client application where you, the users don't have to download everything, but they already have the, 
the game that it, that can be I don't know a few five ten gigabytes, and then you can store high quality textures, and then it it connects to the back end that would be the the IC. Oh, sorry, could could you repeat the question? I'm not sure if I understood. So, so now everything is running on chain on through a browser. And have you thought of creating a native uh, game where it would even run on the on the uh, someone's computer locally? Oh, like like yeah, yeah build, like build for like a PC, like Windows or exactly. Something. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, that it's something we thought about. Um, I think I think there's a bit of friction there, though. You know, um, when when you have to download like a desktop client uh, that creates. It's a, it's a little it's a little bit of friction that some people like aren't willing to you know go and download that that client and install it um, and use it um, and so that's that little bit of friction is also like something that we like we, we think in the future the world will start shifting towards browser based games um, that's kind of the trend that's happening already uh, and that's actually a good topic to bring up um, because I'm a big proponent of like streaming games. Um, which is a whole different conversation. Um, but there, there's also there's also a trend. <laughs> well, well, we can get back to it. Um, there's there's also a trend with uh, mobile games in the last you know eight years or so. Uh, it's basically devoured the like half of the more than half, like sixty percent of the video game market. Um, and a lot of people don't know that that um, like PC and console games are only currently like thirty percent of the video game market, and mobile games are the other like sixty percent. And then there's ten percent that's like random stuff. Um, but that's, that's another thing. I think we're more focused on targeting mobile in the future, um, being, like people being able to play on their phones uh, more than, than uh, doing like a desktop client. Yeah, that was my other question because it's a hurdle to download something big and then have it on your computer and play it. Honestly, it's a complex game. Like you don't want to play GTA 5 in, in the browser. Right. But on the other hand, it's on the mobile phone it can be advantageous because it's easier if you want to come back to a game every day and when you have like five, 10 minutes, then you just open your phone and click on, a, on an icon instead of going to Safari, finding the link and, and so on. Exactly, so, yeah. And that's the thing, once, once you get a person to download a game on their phone, the friction is gone, you know, then it's as easy, it's every day. Like, it's like, it's, it's as easy as we, you know, open Twitter or Instagram every day, it's like a habit. And, you know, exactly. like creating that habit with gamers is huge. Um, where they, they can come back to your game every day and enjoy it. I think you would have a, an advantage over competition in a sense that there are not that many, if any, uh, mobile uh, blockchain games, Web3 games that are, uh, that are included, that have NFTs in them. Yeah. Just yeah. using the blockchain in general. Yeah, it's actually very surprising to me. I, I wonder if it's because most people use like the MetaMask or, or other like, like wallet extensions um in their browser um or yeah I'm, I'm not sure what it is but i think what's cool is that like plug while it now has a mobile app um and so it'd be cool in the future you could have a a mobile game and authenticate you know your login using the plug wallet mobile app um so that's definitely a possibility and I, I think once that possibility emerges we'll definitely consider you know building our game to mobile as well um that, I, one thing i'd recommend though for like I'd say like indie gamers who are just starting out, um, don't try to juggle too many, like don't try to be compatible with everything because um, it's really hard to, to juggle all the, all the different platforms that exist. Um, so it's better to focus on like one niche, create a really fun game. Um, and if you see traction, then, then you can start like broadening which platforms you support. Awesome. Um... So if you weren't working on the IC gallery right now, and now your next game, what kind of game do you think you would build? Let's say I give you uh, full time, uh, free time, and you could work on anything to submit for Supernova. What would you, what would you build? So, so you're being the affinity is going to give me this, right? M million dollars to do whatever <laughs> I want, right? <laughs> uh, I promise. Uh, I'll talk to the team. <laughs> uh, wow, every game developer's dream. Uh, I think I would probably, <laughs> free time. yeah, <laughs> free time and build whatever you want. You, if you tell a game developer that that's their dream. Uh, I think if I were to build another game, I would probably go in the genre of like raising your own pet kind of game. Um, something like, 
like I'm sure everyone, you know, has heard of Tamagotchi. Um, there's, you know, a game on the app store called Talking Tom, which is like you basically, it's a super successful game for kids where you raise this little talking cat. I think it uses AI to like have the cat, you know, learn and how to talk, it learns how to talk to you essentially, the more that you talk to it and you feed it every day, take care of it. But I think that's a really interesting use case for NFTs, you know, um, because, you know, you could have the, the cat be an NFT and, you know, if you're not feeding it every day, it dies and the NFT gets burnt or, oh, you know, which is so kind of savage. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, if you're feeding it every day and, and treating it really well, you know, it could grow some like rare traits on it and you could trade it in the future. Um, so I, I think like the, when, when building a game, you really have to think about how the game genre matches well with the ability to trade NFTs. Um, cause I don't think, you know, integrating NFTs into your game just willy nilly doesn't make sense. Like you, you shouldn't make, you know, every resource in your game an NFT, at least this is purely my opinion. Um, and I'm sure other game developers disagree. Um, but to me, it's like, it doesn't make sense to like, if I had to go on Entrepo and trade, you know, 10 iron ore for 10 gold ore or something like that, like it is those, those, those little, like it's too granular, you know, people want to trade like more, more of the like important items in the game um and so unless if you if you have it in game so if you have it maybe these assets are nfts but if you have an in-game menu that just pops up and then you can burn 10 i don't know and create one whatever metal right right, then right. it's uh you don't see the interaction but it's actually an nft and in, in in theory you could sell your resources to other players instead of just yeah having them lay around or yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's true. I mean, if I think like there's those super players that like really the hardcore players, you know, who will, who will definitely want to trade those NFTs on a third party marketplace. Um, and so, yeah, that, I mean, that could cater to them as well. Um, I think, I think the majority of players though, don't want to deal with the friction of having to trade their, NF their in-game NFTs on a third party marketplace. Um, unless they're like yeah. really important NFTs. Um, but yeah, I think that you really have to think of like, if, if this item in my game is an NFT, the, the whole reason for it being an NFT is that you can trade it, right? And you can verify that it's authentic. Those are the two main reasons. So if, so if there's no reason to trade that item, then don't make it an NFT, you know? Yeah, um, yeah that makes sense. So uh, by this point, I'm sure you guys are, have become IC or experts in IC troubleshooting. And now we have uh, many game developers just joining the IC, submitting something for Supernova. Could you give them some advice on how they can overcome some of the issues or where they can find resources and uh, what they should do when they get stuck? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first place I would recommend you look is probably at the guide I wrote on uh, deploying an IC Unity game. Uh, it goes over like the basics of you know integrating Plug Wallet uh, into your Unity game project, uh, as well as fetching the NFTs in their Plug Wallet using the DAB interface that uh, the Fleet team has also created. Um, and so that's I would say that's like the basic you need for building a game. It's just the ability to log in, fetch your NFTs, and display them in game. Um, and from there, obviously, things get more complicated depending on you know the type of game genre you're building. If you're doing multiplayer, uh, if you need a server, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I would say if, if you're just an indie get indie game dev, that's the first place you should look. Um, there's there's a lot of troubleshooting uh, with you know getting Unity to be able to talk to browser JavaScript um, in order to interact with the plug wallet. Um, and so that's, that guide kind of goes into those intricacies. Um, and, and yeah, that hopefully that is the main blocker for you. There's also a little bit of work. You have to figure out how to, you know, download DFX, which is the internet computer uh, command line tool that allows you to spin up uh, canisters and deploy them. Uh, and there might, there might be issues if your, you know, your game build is too large then you might not be able to deploy it uh, to the internet computer. So also make sure to optimize your game builds. Uh, and if you're using Unity, use that doing, or use addressables to do that uh, so that your game builds are much smaller. 
and I, and I can also make, make a guide on that in the future. Um, if people are interested, I can make a guide on, on how to use addressables with Unity or with, uh, please, with please the IC. Do. Yeah, please do. <laughs> that would be very helpful. Um, yeah, that you might remind me of one of the question, questions I had is um, how do you connect Unity with the Motoko? How do you have the, the game logic? Do you use mostly C Sharp for that or do you use a, a mixture of C Sharp and Motoko? Hmm. Yeah, so, so the way we do it currently uh, is, a, is a bit more complicated because uh, essentially Unity is written in C Sharp. And so in order for Unity C Sharp to talk directly to the internet computer Motoko, you need something called an agent. And so uh, this agent is basically a library that you know, has the tooling needed to be able to talk directly from a programming language to Motoko. Uh, and C Sharp doesn't have that right, right now. Right now, only uh, Rust, JavaScript, and I think C might have it as well. Um, and so what we do is we have our Unity C Sharp talk to JavaScript, and then JavaScript use the agent.js library to talk to Motoko. Um, and it's not ideal. Uh, and so that's why, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure if, if you're active on the internet computer, uh, Twitter, like you'll see many people have been calling for a C Sharp agent to be built. Um, and I, I, I tried to do it. I, I did a little bit of, of uh, digging into it and hit some roadblocks. Um, but if there's anywhere out, anyone out there who's like a C-sharp guru who would love to take on that task, please do. Uh, it would be huge. Um, but yeah, that's, that, but it, it's still possible without the C-sharp agent. Uh, you just have to essentially use JavaScript library plugins with Unity. Um, and those plugins allow you to talk to browser JavaScript, which then allows you to talk to Motoko backend. And you can submit that in the blue sky uh, track for the hackathon if you if you come up with this C sharp agent. And if you yeah, Definity yeah. will pay you if you come up with it. It's yeah, really that's important. for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and and if you don't, then Jordan Last will build it eventually if we wait long enough. <laughs> True. <laughs> All right, we have a question in the in the chat. I like the approach about open metaverse uh, that I see gallery takes. Uh, what? What will be the path on the IC on the IC gallery about uh, Moonwalkers? I see so much potential for them. Uh, I'd like to know the plans for them. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the Moonwalkers are our community for the IC gallery, uh, and so basically, in the future, the Moonwalkers will uh, be receiving benefits in you know the game world that we create. Uh, they'll be, uh, and then those benefits, you know, will be. Things that you know will will we'll feel really good will uh, you know be things that you can show off, um, but also we don't want them to be things that break the game because we we really do think and, and when I say break the game, what I mean is uh, if we could imagine if we could like put ourselves you know five years into the future, uh, what we'd imagine is this huge world of gamers, uh, you know let's say a hundred thousand gamers playing together and the Moonwalkers are just 10,000 of those players because there's only, or 9,999 of them because there's only that many Moonwalkers. Uh, but the they are because one, one, one person might have multiple, right? True, exactly. So, so a lot fewer, fewer than that. Yeah. Uh, and those people are regarded as basically the founders of this metaverse. You know, like if you, if you have a Moonwalker avatar in our game, you would be essentially, you know, one of the coolest people in this world. Um, and you would receive benefits in the game and different things like that. Uh, but our goal is, you know, in, in between now and that five-year horizon, how do we get those 100,000 players into our game? You know, because obviously we love the Moonwalkers. We love you guys and, you know, they're our community and we're going to keep building value for them. But we want to also make this game available to everyone, you know, not just 9,999 people. Um, so we need to open that funnel, you know, and accept everyone. Uh, and so that's why... In, in the future, you'll see that we're partnering with, we're currently partnering with a lot of different NFT projects and building something really cool that we're excited to show you guys. Uh, but our focus is on interoperability uh, and essentially pushing forward the entire internet computer ecosystem rather than just, you know, one project. Um, and, you know, the, we're going to bring the Moonwalkers along with all of that, you know, and continue to, to uh, create that community 
around the IC gallery and what it's going to become in the future. Because it actually isn't going to be staying a gallery for very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, connecting to this. Uh, okay, tell me. So when is the when is the metaverse happening? This is the the latest <laughs> buzzword that we that we got after machine learning and now blockchain or NFTs and the next one is the metaverse. And is Facebook going to build it? That's what, a good question. What <laughs> what do you see the metaverse as a concept in the next like two to five years? And um, you can talk about your process or just the whole ecosystem in general. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I love that question. Um, so I personally hate the word metaverse. Um, and, <laughs> That's a good start. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. So uh, ICP, Maximus, and I have uh, decided that we're completely going to phase that out of our, any of our marketing material or anything to describe what we're building. Um, because we, at this point, we think it's a buzzword. And it doesn't, it, when you say metaverse, it can really describe, people are using it for anything. It can mean a game. It can mean a bunch of digital websites. Like it, it really people just throw it as, I don't know, it, 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 it's lost its meaning. Uh, in the past, like when I was working, you know, for Disney and Scopely, really the only things that we called metaverses were sandbox games. So games where you can create like your own world. Uh, so things like Roblox, um, the sandbox game, which is a crypto native game. Uh, my, Minecraft, those were the only things we called metaverses um, because users could essentially create user-generated games. You know, that's what we would term that as. Um, I would also say Fortnite. Fortnite would also be termed a metaverse um, because it's kind of crossing between a game and an entertainment venue. Um, so it's, it's right. becoming this like place where people just go to, go to hang out, not, not necessarily where they go to play Fortnite. Um, but yeah, so, so that's that word has existed for many, many years in the game industry. Uh, and it's weird that, you know, all of a sudden when Facebook rebranded the meta, it's like every VC and every crypto bro is using, is throwing around metaverse uh, to describe the NFT project. <laughs> it was the other way around. I think it was first NFTs, NFTs did stole the word metaverse and then everyone with NFTs started to build like you can buy a land in my metaverse kind of thing. And then Facebook saw it booming and then they jumped on the train. And then they jumped the on the train. Classic. Exactly. To, <laughs> to, yeah, to uh, ride the hype. Yeah, I could see that too. Um, and now they can, yeah, they can ruin the world. Yeah. yeah now, <laughs> the rest of us. Yeah. Honestly, that, yeah, that was a poor rebrand on their part. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm not going to try to define what the metaverse is. But I think the biggest trends I see, you know, in the future um, would be AR, VR, definitely, you know, augmented reality, VR, uh, virtual reality, and then mixed reality. Uh, you know, there's Apple, Microsoft, and Google are all developing different glasses that allow you to augment your reality. Um, and that could be a huge, you know, place where NFTs develop in the future. Um, you know, augmented reality clothing, augmented reality accessories, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, of course, Facebook is, is developing Horizon, which is their, their metaverse uh, world, uh, which I actually, funny story, applied to work there like three years ago. Um, and I'm really glad that it didn't work because <laughs> I, <laughs> I really hate how they've kind of transitioned um, from what they were building back then. Uh, and basically, they're now basically trying to cannibalize, you know, Web3 and, and the, the NFT market. Um, and so I, I, I really like, I, I'm kind of bearish on, uh, you know, Facebook's meta. Uh, not investment advice. What's that? Not investment advice. Not investment advice. Sorry, I shouldn't use the word bearish. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, You're I don't not think. mistake about the future of Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really, because I don't think Facebook are gamers. Like, I don't think, uh, like, I don't think they're a, a gaming company. And so they really don't know how to build things that people will enjoy and want to come back to. Um, I think what they, they shine in it is they're really good at developing good UX. Um, and so that's one of the things that could maybe, you know, put them a, a, a leg ahead of, of crypto native projects is that Facebook will create probably the best UX, you know, on the planet. And, and they also own Oculus, which is the, the leading VR headset. So it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, despite would, all that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they would probably go for something like a productivity. I think they are, they are uh, aiming for productivity focused uh, experiences first and then just games as, uh, as secondary. 
Yeah, and that's and that's as I was about to say. That's I think where they'll shine is I think they're working on like remote work solutions. Um, so like things like you know putting on your VR headset and you have like ten monitors to work on, or an augmented reality glasses and you have all these displays, heads up displays. Uh, I really think that could change remote remote work forever. Um, I don't think that gaming is necessarily going to be their forte, um, and I think gaming is probably the most lucrative. Uh, you know vision for for the metaverse um so what we'll see there, there's all these there's so many different metaverses being developed right now i mean you got like uh board of yacht clubs building their other side you have the central land the sandbox um and i'm not sure if any of them really hit the nail on the head we'll see um but interoperability i think is the most important thing in this future metaverse you know being being able to own like i was, I was talking to andrew tang about this um, it, th there needs to be a standard basically where, you know, you can create, like, let's, let's say you own, uh, a Spider-Man, you know, uh, character in a game and, uh, let's, let's say it's an RPG game and you own the Spider-Man character and you want to take that character now and play with it in League of Legends, which is, you know, a, a battle arena game. So, you know, being able to transfer that as an NFT from one game to the other, that's huge. That's, you know, that's the whole reason that NFTs are, are the biggest thing is because that interoperability and transferability between games. Um, and right now there's no standard for that. Like every game is kind of just building a siloed environment for their own NFT project. Um, like Board Ape is building the Board Ape Yacht Club metaverse and the Sandbox is building the Sandbox metaverse. And every NFT project is building a metaverse for their own, you know, 10,000 NFTs. And so like no one's really playing with each other. Everyone's just kind of playing with the other, you know, people that invested in the project. Um, and so I think that's right. the issue that needs to be solved. Is, and, that's, and that's not an easy issue to solve. Like 3D model interoperability is one of the hardest issues to solve. Uh, so we'll see where, what happens with that. I guess it helps with consistency because if you're building your own world and you have your own characters in it, then, then you can make them however you want. You can optimize the experience. But if you if you have to support all kinds of different characters from different environments, then it can get uh, it can look like a bit clocky or like put together. Yeah, exactly. And the, and there's yeah, there's so many issues that come up with that. Like uh, you have to deal with things like optimizing polygon counts on 3D models, you know, texture sizes on 3D models. Uh, animations because there's no really standard for like you have like .glb file .gltf files .fbx files which is what Unity uses .object files and now there's there's uh, VR native files like .vrm um, and they all use different ways for animating and rigging models and so how do you how do you integrate all that you know into your game um, so we'll we'll see. Yeah, we I think the, it really takes like the game developer community needs to come together and create a VR native file format um, that's just interoperable. And I think either that or there needs to be support for all those file formats for all the NFT projects. Um, so we'll, we'll see. When you, so when you export your 3D character in an NFT, then you would create kind of six files or? Yeah, exactly. Um, and, so, and so that's something like we've kind of talked about you know, in the internet computer community is that it's really cool because, you know, we have like, let's say if we had uh, one canister per one NFT on the, on the internet computer, you could essentially, you have four gigabytes of data storage in that one canister and you could have all the file formats that you want. I mean, you could have an image, a video, five different 3D file formats, you know, and, and, and you could all have that be one NFT. Um, and so that, so any game could essentially pick and choose whatever file formats they want to use. You can even have a 2D sprite sheet if you're, you know, if you, you want a, like a, a 2D game like Pokemon or something to integrate. Um, right. And it would help with interoperability as well. So if you have your character and then you design it in both 2D and 3D and make, you make a pixelated version of it, then you can place it in different environments and it would still work well. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so I, yep. that's probably the biggest hurdle, I think, with the general NFT community and the, the game dev NFT community. But yeah, let, let's not talk about the hurdles. I, I think it's my like, last question because we're still running out of uh, time. If, if you, you can be optimistic about these metaverses and how this uh, development goes in the next two to five years, 
what kind of games do you see or what kind of experiences do you see down the line? Would it be all VR or mm. do we still have uh, nice web-based based, uh, metaverse style games? Yeah, I, that's hard to predict. Uh, I mean, five years ago, people were saying that right now we'd be sitting in VR all the time, which clearly isn't <laughs> that's the case. True. That's true. So, <laughs> so you know, th- to say that VR is the future is a, is a hard thing to say. Um, but gaming is a future for sure. Uh, without a doubt. And the present. Sorry? And the present. Yeah. Sorry. And the present. Exactly. Yeah. It's the, the gaming sector is only going to grow and people are going to be playing more and more games. And that's the metaverse. You know, I, I don't think the metaverse is necessarily people just standing around looking at galleries. You know, I think uh, gaming brings this element of like, you, you want to do something with your friends. You want to enjoy something with your friends and gaming, you know, is, is that. And I think the trend we'll see with the metaverse is that it'll become very gaming focused. Um, so like, if you notice like a game like Fortnite started out as a game and then became a metaverse. And that's, I think what a lot of businesses will, you know, that's the, that's the plan they should adopt um, rather than trying to be a metaverse and then integrate gaming as like a side thought. Um, Cause that's I mean, gaming point. is the only reason pl- people play, you know, things online is it's for games. So um, yeah, it should be fun first and a metaverse second. Exactly. Uh, and, and especially when you have interoperable games, that just takes it to a whole new level. So, I mean, I'm super excited for the metaverse where we have a bunch of different interoperable games and people are like easily, you know, logging in with their Web3 identities between different games, transferring NFTs, uh, playing and earning, not playing to earn, but playing and earning. Uh, key, key distinction there, because one, key, one you're Very good distinction, fun. yeah. <laughs> Play for fun, um, and you get some some chunk of change uh, on the side. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we are exactly at time. So thank you very much, Tommy, for the the wealth of knowledge that you poured onto us, and and hope this was inspired uh, inspiring for attendees. Thank you very much for joining. Tomorrow we will have another session with Simplex. Uh, they will they will show us uh, their own on ramp uh, fiat on ramp platform, and we have a live coding session with Carl Peacock. So. Please be sure to join. We'll we'll share these on Divinity Social and everything. And yeah, thanks again for for joining. Thanks, Tommy, for uh, for the chat. And let's do this again. Let's do this again once uh, once we have something else yeah. to show. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do this. Um, exciting stuff in store for the IC Gallery, and it won't be called the IC Gallery pretty soon. So I'm excited for it to be called something else. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Cheers.